chapter 12. We sit after Potsdam, and we were overtaken by a storm. It was so violent, and the rain fell in such torrents that we took refuge in a neighboring house. Napoleon was wrapped in his gray military great coat, and on entering the house, he was much astonished to see a young female who seemed to be much agitated by his presence. She proved to be a native of Egypt, and she evinced for Napoleon all the religious veneration which he had been accustomed to receive from the Arabs. She was the widow of an officer of the Army of the East, and fate had conducted her to Saxony and to the very house in which the emperor was now received. Napoleon granted her a pension of 1,200 francs and undertook to provide for the education of her son, who was the only dowry her husband had left her. This, said Napoleon, is the first time I ever took shelter against a storm. I felt a presentiment that a good action awaited me. We found Potsdam, an injured. The court had even fled so precipitately that nothing had been removed Frederick the Great's sword and belt and the cordon of his orders all were left. Napoleon took possession of them. I prefer these trophies, said he with enthusiasm, to all the king of precious treasures. I will send them to my veterans who served in the campaign of Hanover. I will present them to the governor of the hospital of the invalids by whom they will be preserved as a testimony of the victories of the great army and the revenge it has taken for the disasters of Rusbach. No sooner had we entered Potsdam than we were besieged by deputations. They came from Saxony, from Weimar, and from all quarters. Napoleon received them with the utmost affability. The envoy of the Duke of Brunswick, who recommended his subjects to the generosity of the French, was, however, received less courteously than the rest. If, said Napoleon to the person who presented the deputation, I were to demolish the city of Brunswick, if I were to leave not a stone of the walls standing, what would your prince think of me? And yet, would not the law of retaliation authorize me to do in Brunswick what the duke would have done in my capital? To announce the design of destroying cities may be the act of a madman, but to attempt to sell you the honor of a whole army of brave troops, to wish to mark out a course for us to quit Germany merely on the summons of the Prussian army is a fact which posterity will with difficulty credit. The Duke ought not to have attempted such an outrage. When a general has grown gray in the career of arms, he should know how to respect military honor. It was not certainly in the plains of Champagne that the Duke acquired the right of insulting the French standard. Such a proposition can reflect dishonor only on him who made it. The disgrace does not attach itself to the King of Prussia, but to the general to whom, in the present difficult circumstances, he resigned the care of his affairs, in short, to the Duke of Brunswick, whom France and Prussia will blame for the calamities of the war. The violent example set by the old general served as an authority for impetuous youth and led the king to act in opposition to his own opinion and positive conviction. However, sir, you may assure the inhabitants of Brunswick that the French will prove themselves generous enemies, that it is my desire, as far as regards them, to alleviate the miseries of war, and that the evils which may arise from the passage of the troops through their territory is contrary to my wish. Tell the Duke of Brunswick that he shall be treated with all the consideration due to an enemy's officer, but that I cannot acknowledge one of the King of Prussia's generals as a sovereign. If the House of Brunswick should forfeit the sovereignty of its ancestors, the blame must rest with the author of the two wars, who in the one wished to sap the very foundation of the great French capital, and in the other attempted to cast disgrace on 200,000 brave troops who, though they may perhaps be defeated, will never be found to depart from the path of glory and honor. Much blood has been shed within a few days. Prussia is the victim of great disasters, and she may justly blame the man who, with a word, might have averted them. If, like Nestor, raising his voice in the council, he had said, Inconsiderate youths, be silent. Women, return to your domestic duties, and you, sire, listen to the companion of the most illustrious of your predecessors. Since the Emperor Napoleon does not wish to maintain hostilities, do not oblige him to choose between war and dishonor. Do not engage in a dangerous conflict with an army which prides itself in 15 years of glorious achievements and whom victory has accustomed to subdue everything. Instead of holding this language, which would have been so well suited to the prudence of his age, 
and the experience of his long career, he was the first to raise the cry of war. He had even violated the ties of blood by arming his son, Prince Eugène of Württemberg, against his father. He threatened to plant his standard on the palace of Stuttgart and accompany all these acts by imprecations against France. He declared himself the author of that wild manifesto, the production of which he had disavowed for the space of 14 years, though it was out of his power to deny having affixed his signature to it. Spandau had been surrendered to marshaled land. Napoleon visited the fortress and inspected it minutely. He sent me to Berlin, which had been entered by Davu, and directed me to present his compliments to old Ferdinand, his wife. I found the prince very melancholy and dejected. He just lost his son. The princess appeared more calm and resigned. I also went to pay compliments to the Prince Henry and Princess of Hesse, the sister to the King of Prussia. The former appeared very sensible to the attention evinced by Napoleon. The latter had retired to a wing of the castle where she lived tranquilly in the society of her grandchildren. The situation of this princess inspired me with interest and veneration. She appeared to take courage and she begged me to recommend her to Napoleon who paid her a visit immediately on his arrival. She inspired him with the same favorable sentiments which I had conceived for her. The emperor fixed his headquarters at Charlottenburg. On the following day, he made his entrance into the capital and addressed the following proclamation to the army. Soldiers, you have fulfilled my expectations and fully justified the confidence of the French people. You have endured privation and fatigue with courage, equal to the intrepidity and presence of mind which you evinced on the field of battle. You are the worthy defenders of the honor of my crown and the glory of the great French people. So long as you continue to be animated by the spirit which you now display, nothing can oppose you. I know not how to distinguish any particular court. You have all proved yourselves good soldiers. The following is the result of our exertions in this campaign. One of the first powers in Europe which lately proposed to us a dishonorable capitulation has been overthrown. The forests and defiles of Franconia, the Salle, and the Elba, which our fathers would not have crossed in seven years. We have traversed in seven days, and in that short interval, we have had four engagements and one great battle. Our entrance into Potsdam and Berlin has preceded the fame of our victories. We have made 60,000 prisoners, taken 65 standards, among which are the colors of the King of Prussia's guards, 600 pieces of cannon, and three fortresses. Among the prisoners, there are upwards of 20 generals. But notwithstanding all this, more than half our troops regret not having fired a single musket. All the provinces of the Prussian monarchy, as far as the odor, are in our power. Soldiers, the Russians boast of coming to meet us, but we will advance to meet them. We will save them half their march. They will meet with another Austerlis in the midst of Prussia, a nation which can so soon forget our generous treatment of her after that battle in which the emperor's court and the wrecks of his army owed their safety only to the capitulation we granted them it is a nation that cannot successfully contend with us while we march to meet the Russians' new corps formed in the interior of our empire, will repair hither to occupy our present stations and protect our conquests. My people all rose indignantly on hearing the disgraceful capitulation which the Prussian ministers, in their madness, proposed to us. Our frontier roads and towns are filled with conscripts who are burning with eagerness to march in your footsteps. We will not again be the dupes of a treacherous peace. We will not lay down our arms until we compel the English, those eternal enemies of France, to renounce their plan of disturbing the continent and to relinquish the tyranny which they maintain on the seas. Soldiers, I cannot better express the sentiments I entertain for you than by assuring you that I bear in my heart the love which you daily evince for me. Chapter 14. Napoleon next proceeded to the camp and reviewed the Third Corps, and every individual who had particularly distinguished himself was rewarded either by promotion or by a decoration. The generals, officers, and subalterns were assembled round the emperor. I wish to call you together, said he, in order to express my satisfaction of your brilliant conduct in the Battle of the 14th. I lost many brave men, whom I looked upon as my sons. I deeply regret them. But after all, they fell on the field of glory. They perished like true soldiers. You have rendered me a signal service on this memorable occasion. We are in particular indebted to the excellent conduct of the Third Corps. 
for the great results we have obtained. Tell your men that I am satisfied with the courage they have displayed. Generals, officers, subaltern officers, and privates, you possess eternal claims of my gratitude and kindness. The marshal replied that the Third Corps would always prove itself worthy of the Emperor's confidence, that it would constantly be to him what the Tenth Legion was to Caesar. Mr. Dinon was present at this interesting scene, which his pencil will evince, perhaps commemorate. But whatever be the talent of the artist, he can never convey an idea of the satisfaction and kindness which beamed in the features of the sovereign or the devotedness and gratitude expressed in the countenances of all present from the marshal down to the meanest soldier. The proclamation which Napoleon had addressed to the troops inspired them with new ardor. They rushed forward to pursue the wrecks of the forces, which had been engaged at Hal and Yenna. The Prince of Hohenlohe had rallied a considerable mass with which he might have escaped us, but he was not sufficiently speedy. He lost time, and these delays afforded us the hope of seeing him cut off. Napoleon impatiently looked for this event. Brudetat, said he to me, as we were entering the palace, must by this time be a cremen. He will surely have come up with the Russians. Murat will attack them with his usual impetuosity. Both together must have a greater force than is necessary to beat them. In a few days hence, the Prince of Hohenlohe, with all his corps, will be in my hands. And I shall soon after have all their artillery and baggage. But we must act together, for it is not probable that they will suffer themselves to be taken without coming to an engagement. Everything happened as Napoleon had foretold. The Prussians, who were thrown into disorder by the attack of our cavalry and the showers of grape shot, were summoned to surrender by General Billiard, and they laid down their arms. 25,000 picked troops, 45 standards, 74 pieces of artillery defiled before us. It was another conquest of Ulm. The emperor was transported with his success. This is well, said he, but we have not yet got Blucher, who is so clever at making extempore armistices, we must have him also. He immediately addressed the following lines to Murat. Nothing is done so long as anything remains undone. You have turned General Blucher's cavalry. Let me soon hear that his force has experienced the fate of Hohenlohe's. Bertier also wrote to him as follows. To call his attention to the Duke of Weimar, independently of the little detached columns, there are three principal ones. First, that commanded by Prince Hohenlohe, which you have taken at Prince Love. Second, Blucher's column, which at daybreak on the 28th quitted Wissenberg, and which you must certainly have fallen in with today at Passovalk. And third, the Duke of Weimar's column, which escaped Marshal Sully affected and affected the passage of the Elba, as it would appear near Sauden and Havelsberg on the 26th, whence it proceeded in the direction of Wisterhausen, Neuruppen, Grasse, or Fürstenberg. From Havelsberg to Fürstenberg is a distance of 25 leagues. Consequently, the Duke of Weimar cannot reach Fürstenberg on the 28th, but from Fürstenberg to Pesselvelk, is only 20 leagues distance. And if the enemy's column should take that route, you will certainly fall in with it at Passovalk on the 30th or the 31st. Thus, it may be presumed that nothing can escape between you and Marshal's land and Bernadotte, such as the information which I am enabled to communicate to you from the accounts that have reached the emperor. But the duke was tired of sharing the disasters of the Prussian army. He negotiated and transferred the command of his troops to Blucher, who, intent on his retreat, fled without caring or even knowing where he went. His route disconcerted Napoleon. What does he intend, said he? Whither is he going? I cannot imagine that he will throw himself into Holstein, for when once there, he will find no means of retreat. He can never cross the Elba. He will be driven up, and his troops will be drowned. He will never think of making such an attempt. We shall soon have him here. Blucher laid down arms some days after. He had passed through the whole oppression, had violated the Danish territory with no other object than to defer for a few days a surrender between 20 and 25,000 men. The standards and the last artillery of the Prussians, with a little more skill, Blucher might have turned his obstinacy to bitter account. Well, said Napoleon on learning this news, they are now advancing with the Austrians. 
They will be more reserved in future. They will say nothing more about Ulm in three weeks. They have four times renewed it. Blucher must be sent to France, to Dijon. There he may amuse himself in forging armistices. Right to General Billiard, the following dispatch was sent off. Berlin, October 13th, 1806. To General Billiard, Chief of the General Staff of the Reserve of Cavalry, is the Emperor's intention that the greatest care be taken, that all the prisoners belonging to the column of General Blucher and the Duke of Weimar should be sent to France. His Majesty wishes that all the generals and officers should also proceed to France. General Blucher will be conducted by an officer to Dijon, the young prince of Brunswick must also be escorted by an officer to chalon sur marne All the other officers must be conveyed to the different quarters of France fixed upon by the minister de Jean for the prisoners of war. We do not venture to inter- interrupt the emperor until he had finished dictating the dispatch. But when he had concluded it, we interceded in favor of General Blucher. We represented that he had laid down his arms that he was no longer dangerous, and that it was necessary to make some allowance for his hussar habits. Napoleon acknowledged the justice of our suggestions, and Blucher retired to Hamburg. Chapter 15. Prince Hatzfeld had come to Potsdam as a deputy from the city of Berlin and had been well received. He rendered an account of his mission, as well as I can recollect, to Count Hohenlohe and reported to him the state of the troops, artillery, and ammunition that were in the capital, or which he had met on the road. His letter was intercepted. Napoleon delivered it to me with orders immediately to arrest the prince and send him to the headquarters of Marshal de Vaux, which were two leagues distant. Bertier de Roc, Calincourt, and I vainly endeavored to appease the anger of Napoleon. He refused to listen to our representations. Monsieur de Hatzfeld had transmitted reports relative to military affairs, which were quite unconnected with his mission. He had evidently been acting the part of a spy. Severi, who, in his quality of commander of the military gendarmerie, usually took cognizance of affairs of this kind, was then on a mission. I was obliged to assume his functions during his absence. I gave orders for the arrest of the prince, but instead of having him conducted to the headquarters of Davu, I placed him in the chamber of the officer commanding the palace guard, whom I directed to treat him with every mark of respect. Calincourt de Roc withdrew from the emperor's apartment. Napoleon was left alone at Bertier, and he directed him to sit down and write the order by which Monsieur de Hatzfeld was to be arraigned before a military commission. The major general made some representations in his favor. Your majesty will not, for so trivial an offense, shoot a man who is connected with the first families of Berlin. The thing is impossible. You will not think of it. The emperor grew more angry. Neuchâtel persisted in his intercession. Napoleon lost all patience. Bertier quitted the room. I was called in. I had overheard the scene that had just taken place. I was afraid to hazard the least reflection. I was in a state of agony. Besides the repugnance, I felt in being instrumental to so harsh a measure. It was necessary to write as rapidly as the emperor spoke. And I must confess, I never possessed that talent. He dictated to me the following order. Our cousin, Marshal de Vaux, will appoint a military commission consisting of seven colonels of his staff, of which he will be the president, to try the Prince of Hotsville on the charge of treason and espionage. A sentence must be pronounced and executed before six o'clock in the evening. It was about noon. The point directed me to dispatch the order immediately and to send with it the Prince of Hotsville's letter. The latter part of the instruction I did not, however, obey. My mind was racked by the most painful emotions. I trembled for the prince, and I trembled for myself, since instead of sending him to Davout's headquarters, I had lodged him in the palace. Napoleon wished to have his horse saddled, as he intended to visit Prince and Princess Ferdinand. So I was going out to give the necessary orders. I was informed that the Princess of Hatsfield had fainted in the antechamber, and that she had previously expressed a wish to speak to me. I went to her. I did not conceal from her the displeasure of Napoleon. I told her that we were going to ride out on horseback, and I directed her to repair to Prince Ferdinand and to interest him in favor of her husband. I know not whether she did so, but on our arrival at the palace, we found her in one of the corridors, and she threw herself in tears at the feet of the emperor, to whom I announced her name. The princess was in a state of pregnancy. Napoleon was moved by her situation and directed her to proceed to the castle. He, at the same time, desired me to write to Davu to order the ex- the trial to be suspended. He thought Monsieur de Hatzfeld had departed. 
Napoleon returned to the palace where Madame de Hatzfeld was waiting for him. He desired her to enter the saloon. I was present. Your husband, Madame, said he, has brought himself into an unfortunate scrape, according to our laws. He deserves to be sentenced to death. General Rapp, give me his letter. Here, Madame, read this. The lady trembled exceedingly. Napoleon immediately took the letter from her hand, tore it, threw the fragments into the fire. I have no other proof against the Prince of Hatzfeld, Madame. Therefore, he is at liberty. He ordered me immediately to release him from the confinement at headquarters. I acknowledged that I had not set him there. But he did not reproach me. He even seemed pleased at what I had done. And this affair, Bertier de Rock and Calancourt, Behaved as they did on all occasions, that is to say, like gallant men, Bertie's conduct was particularly praiseworthy. No sooner had the Prince of Hatzfeld returned to his family than he was made acquainted with all that had passed. He wrote me a letter expressive of his gratitude and the emotions by which he was agitated. It was as follows. My dear general, amidst the sensations of every kind which I experienced yesterday, I was not unmindful of the marks of your sensibility and the interest you evinced for me. Yesterday evening, I devoted wholly to the society of my family, and therefore I could not until today discharge the debt I owe to you. There are moments in life, the recollection of which can never be effaced. And if you attach any value to the profound gratitude and esteem of an honest man, you will be rewarded for the interest you have shown for me. Accept the assurance of my high consideration and of those sentiments which render it impossible. I can never forget you. I have the honor to be. My dear general, your very humb- humble and very obedient servant, Prince de Hatzfeld, Berlin, September 30th, 1806.